Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our live presentation on tips for a successful system integration. I am Sarah Ganella. I'm VP of Marketing and Sales at Full Sail Partners. Full Sail Partners is a Dell Tech reseller, implementer, trainer, and integration specialist. We are the creator of the Black Box Connector, an integration platform helping firms connect their Dell Tech system to the outside world. Black Box Connector was created seven plus years ago, and throughout that time, we have helped firms integrate to multiple solutions, including ADP, Concur, Client Feedback, MailChimp, Informer, and many other solutions. Now we, more than ever, we are finding professional services firms rely on data synchronization between systems to ensure consistency and accuracy across different departments and teams. More and more firms are exploring how to get this data from one system to another. And we wanted to tackle this topic today to help firms as they explore connecting systems. Tomorrow, Pete, who is joining me today, has a blog coming out, which is really a guide to help people understand more about the basics related to synchronizing data. It'll cover why synchronize systems, what APR, APIs are, what endpoints and methods are, and it is also just a good blog for those wanting to gain more insight on the basics. But today, our topic will get more in depth. Today, I have Pete Newfer with me. He is Director of Product Development at Full Sail Partners. Hello, Pete. Are you ready for today's topic? Hey, Sarah. It's good to be here, and yes, I am. Perfect. So let's dive in. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about considerations firms should keep in mind when integrating, where things can go wrong, and also Pete will be sharing with us tips on how to plan for a successful integration. We also want to encourage our audience to ask questions, so be sure to, to let us know that you're here and also be sure to ask questions along the way. So Pete, let's dive in. The first question regarding integrations is really, what are the options for integrating your system? You know, and, and Sarah, that is a question that we get asked a lot here. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, seems to have come to greater prominence now that um, the entire Did we lose Pete? integrated oh, oh i'm sorry did, maybe it was I, me that lost connection there for a second i did see things blip out a little bit just just in uh in case everybody did lose me and let's hope my data connection holds here um <laughs> it, it's a great question it's one we get asked a lot these days um and i think a lot of that has to do with where integrations were once determined or, or kind of viewed as a specialty subject that only very large organizations could possibly entertain implementing um, organizations um, have made it uh, much more commonplace and uh, software publishers like Dell Tech have made it a lot more accessible now where it's almost less of a sideline and almost an expectation that you're going to need different systems just to operate your businesses and the various departments within it. So um, in terms of uh, the first one, let's start with the basics. This is one that's uh, basically as old as the personal computer. And that's uh, what I like to call the good old chair to keyboard interface. That's uh, this little device here that sits between the chair and the keyboard and uh, manually moves data back and forth. This is uh, a somewhat antiquated, antiquated methodology, but you know what? It works. Um, it's very slow. It's very laborious. And more importantly than anything, it takes a lot of time away from your staff being productive in other areas of the business. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of losing some of its uh, some of its luster, um, especially especially in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. But I have um, found it's a great place to start. Um, understanding that dual process helps you with those next steps, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the big things that we typically will ask um, a client or a, 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 a business partner um, when they're looking for something for an integration is how do you do it manually? Because those rules that you've established for, hey, when you see some, a business, an opportunity come in from our sales pipeline system, mm -hmm. that is this particular type of stage, that's when it needs to go and have a 
project created, say if that's being tracked in your ERP system, um, or this is the kind of project manager that needs to be assigned to this type of disciplined project. Those business rules, just like a, a human would need to understand what those on are any kind of uh, application programming, any kind of automated interface um, that you may have would also need to have those rules very clearly and very explicitly defined so that you can get the desired results. Perfect. Well, let's dive into uh, file-based integration. So what does that look like? Well, that's another old reliable one, and it's actually still used pretty commonly, especially when you have uh, endpoints that um, maybe you're a little antiquated in terms of, or not even antiquated, but let's say uh, a little uh, security conscious, where they don't necessarily want to be doing things, uh, or they're, they're API nervous, right? They're web services adverse, I guess we could, we could say something <laughs> like that. Um, but then they also, because some of these applications uh, concur, uh, uh, SAP Concur is a great example. Um, uh, some of these uh, in, uh, some of these application platforms have been around for quite some time, so there's a big infrastructure behind it. So uh, when we say flat file based, that's the process of moving a flat file over to a repository, someplace where it'll get picked up. There's some piece of programming, maybe an SSIS package, maybe an automated import routine but some kind of uh, some degree of varying degrees of automation or even a manual human process will take a file, download it and import it into the uh, destination system. So it's a uh, it's an older way of doing things, um, but it is still one that is is around and and, uh, and and can be reliable. What are some examples of file types related to a file based integration? Just to give our audience a little bit more insight there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've seen uh, the most common one is probably what's called CSV or comma separated value or any delimited value where basically a certain character in the case of a CSV that's a comma takes the place of a column. Um, so you have a given value for column A, first name, a given value for co comma, a given value for column B, last name. Um, this can be any real spe special delimiter character like a bar right, or even a tilde, um, something mm -hmm. that is typically not used uh, pretty frequently. Some some applications will even support uh, Excel documents, but typically it does need to be a structured flat file like that, like a CSV or an Excel document. Okay. Um, XML is another good example of that. You can actually use um, XML uh, documents as a, as a method of transference. Yeah, what about some of the, the file transfer methods related to a file-based integration? Well, and it depends on the on the type, right? Um, with certain instances, uh, like the uh, Dell Tech's built-in uh, payroll export functionality, that will actually, um, and I just, uh, that will actually, um, pardon me, my screen just blanked out there. Um, that will actually, that accommodates uh, exporting a flat file, uh, effectively a CSV file, and then logging into uh, the ADP system and then uploading that. Um, you can also use um, FTP, uh, file mm -hmm. transfer protocol, more uh, also SFTP, which is just secure tra file transfer protocol, um, slightly different ports, everything like that. So those those uh, file transfer mechanisms are ways to automate that process. So you don't actually actually have to go to the user interface and download and upload sometimes. OK, perfect. I think those two methods right there, the dual and the file-based integration. A lot of people are very familiar with that, but let's jump into some of these other areas as we really get into integrating and helping to automate uh, this process. What is ETL? ETL is kind of a data database uh, uh, nerds uh, uh, term for uh, extract, transform, and load. Right? And effectively what that means is, especially when you're dealing with systems that you can directly interact with the database component of the application. Um, so op opening SQL Management Studio, or say uh, you have server A or database A and database B, they're on the same network or at least trusted networks, and you can run queries and move data back and forth. Um, typically it's done in SQL or uh, SSIS, um, packages, all, all part of the SQL Server platform. Um, and those are automations. So basically, you will write uh, a piece of code that will facilitate moving the data from point A to point B, 
um, perhaps doing some consistency checks, perhaps doing a little bit of logic or derivative logic in terms of, hey, when you do see a uh, opportunity or a, uh, a contract come in for uh, the civil group, make sure it gets assigned over to our Scott Seal project manager. Things like logic like that can be uh, incorporated into it. So, and you can kind of tell as we're going down this list, Sarah, it's becoming a little less, um, little less inner, a little less human uh, action required, and a little more now at this point when we're talking about ETL functions, we're talking about potentially scheduling routines, maybe even exposing a stored procedure through a mm -hmm. button in your Dell Tech Vantage Point system. Um, having it run on a regular basis, maybe having it run from an external system, but we're getting a little, we're getting further down the road to automating it and making it an efficient process. Yep. So let's jump in web services. So now, now we're in, and this is kind of a, a buzzword right now, but this is uh, web services are effectively think of it. Like if, if, if that program that you'd written in SQL, could go into not just a database or a system that was local in your network, but say an external system like a Salesforce or like a constant contact um, or an ADP. Um, you can effectively, with, with by leveraging web services, um, you can go in and on the Dell Tech side of things, we have a great REST web service and vantage point now that's very, I, I don't want to say very easy, but much easier to uh, navigate than the previous uh, uh, web service, uh, SOAP, uh, that mm -hmm. Vision had. Um, and by hitting Dell Tech, we can then go in and query information. We can uh, add update information um, in the Dell Tech system. And Salesforce, for example, has the same kind of interaction. So you can write an application that will basically go in and communicate, say, again, with the Salesforce, grab the contract uh, from the Salesforce uh, footprint you have, bring that down, query to see if the contract is there in Dell Tech Vantage Point. Oh, if it is, well, well, then we just need to update it. Well, if it's not, then we need to add it in. So here we're reaching a level of sophistication that really speaks to automation and really speaks to efficiency. Again, though, as we're saying this, you can see how all those rules we talked about establishing earlier with our good old chair to keyboard interface, mm -hmm. they become even more critical as we get down to this kind of point where we're trying to establish automations to that degree. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the last one, middleware platforms. And this is this is near and dear to my heart with our work with uh, Blackbox over the years. But um, there are a uh, bevy of, of products out there and software publishers out there that have realized that constructing a standalone application to leverage web services or a combination of ETL functionality and web services can be somewhat cumbersome for your typical business. Um, you know, again, back to the chair to keyboard interface, there are other things that you probably want your folks working on. Then besides especially this or building up the rudimentary components of this, things like uh, call history logging, things like uh, pre-built uh, authentication mechanisms, things that you can kind of leverage all the expertise that these companies that have already done use and come to market with either something that's kind of out of the box and ready to go or something that you can leverage almost like a software development toolkit that a, a handy developer could get in and really make use of some of these tools to be able to you know, get, get rid of all the minutia that it takes to build up and start these things and just start with, okay, I need to authenticate to Dell Tech. I need to authenticate to Salesforce. Okay, I have that done. I need, I need my contracts from Salesforce to come in and do this to my projects in Dell Tech. And so now a lot of those kind of if then statements, um, circular logic, loops, some of those things are gonna be handled for you at that point, or at least have the building blocks or the software development toolkit that you can write against to create those. Okay, perfect. We do have a question uh, that came in and I wanted to go ahead and pull this up. So uh, Rob Hutchinson, he said, you mentioned ADP. Does Dell Tech integrate with other payroll services? And I think this is a, a great question because we get this all the time. You guys have done this. Shouldn't it be super simple just to do it with another platform? Right. And, and you know, the, the answer is, well, sort of. Yeah, sure. It, it, it can be. Um, look, every software publisher out there is going to handle things a little different. Um, 
web services and APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, um, these are things that have standards about them. Um, they, they ha there is a, there are multiple standard standardization documents on how to perform authentication. Just the basic handshake to say, hey, I am who I am, you can let me in, mm -hmm. right? Um, everyone does it a little different, right? So um, out of the box, Dell Tech does have an export to payroll interface that um, a lot of our, our folks on our consulting team have had great uh, success with uh, leveraging some of that to be able to work with other payroll providers. Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, we're talking about, you know, employee numbers and then segmentation of hours into buckets. You know, and it's more, most, there, there's some payroll folks on the phone that are probably rolling their eyes saying it's a lot more complicated than that, buddy. And I, I agree, it is. But at the, at, at the base most, that, that export to pay functionality is pretty flexible. Deltex done a, a really good job with that um, in kind of making a baseline for it. Um, with some of the other integrations that you have, you're going to find differences in terms of the integration components, the integration points. Um, just as an example, uh, UKG has a really great um, report as a service option where you can literally get everything you would need for an employee record from one singular endpoint. Um, ADP has about 15 endpoints that constitute that same data structure that you need to hit appropriately to get that data back. Um, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means you need to know where to go. And some of that legwork, again, that's kind of the segmentation there between, um, you know, building your own internal web service solution and having the time and resources to go and look into that and pilot and explore that, work with the ADP representatives you have or the specific payroll provider to say, all right, this is the stuff I need. Here's what my manual here's what my charity keyboard interface does. I need the APIs that can open up that functionality that can give me that data that I would need now right against it. That's where sometimes it's a little easier to look at a middleware provider to say, Hey, you've already got some of these things built out. Can you just, can you just pick it up and take it from here? So um, it, point being basically with APIs and web services, if they, if the application has an API, you can integrate with it. The base, depending on the functional nature of that API and what data is available, some of the integration points may need to be adjusted or balanced out based on, you know, what you want versus what's actually available. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, if it has an API, um, you can pretty much, you, it's, it's or, or an import utility, right? Like the Dell Tech import utility. There are integration potentials in those uh, in those circumstances from those software publishers. Yeah, and so um, and specifically to answer, and uh, I wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about uh, when people come to us about you've integrated this, can you also do that? But to answer Rob's question, also specifically, we do have it with ADP, and we have actually begin we've begun the process with UKG, correct? Um, but we're not fully there yet, right? It's it's um yeah it's it's we we do have a functional integration that's actually just went uh, is going live uh, hopefully this week okay. um, on it but that so that's at the end of the the completion cycle and yeah so it's uh, again it it's that it, it can be done absolutely you know um and a lot of the times it just involves getting a hold of the software publisher you know and depending on how you approach this right. Um, uh, working with the software publisher to make sure that they're giving everything, you know, making accessible all the data points that you need to support your business processes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, let's uh, go on to the next area. So what are, there are several common pitfalls that a lot of times people will face when synchronizing data between systems. So let's talk a little bit about what can go wrong. All right, so uh, how much time do we have? Let me yeah. see here, okay, good. Um, now it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty finite list and it really just comes down to, at the top of it is really planning, but let's kind of go through all of it um, here really quick. Um, uh, data mapping errors, is really one of the biggest challenges we see. Even if you come into an integration and a provider like, like us or uh, any, any of the other kind of uh, middleware platforms that have this kind of thing, um, if you have data that is in system A, and let's, let's, we, we can use, a, let's use an HRIS system as, as an example. Um, if your uh, company and department and division structures out in uh, your HRIS system, 
are all coded differently and even named differently than what your Dell Tech organization structure is. At that point, and a lot of folks on the on the on the call today have probably gone through a data migration at some point when you went to Dell Tech Vision, and there's a process in that called data mapping, right? So at that point, if data doesn't align, just for and again, we're just talking about the org field here, right, or the mm -hmm. home company field and the employee we have to establish a data map, which is basically a crosswalk document, which says when you see column A, that doesn't relate to anything in column B, but this is the relationship here. We're gonna relate th this over to here, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Uh, of course, apples are called uh, grapes over here, but that's okay, that's why we're, we're mapping them. So it can make it very convoluted, and we'll talk about this later, it can make it very maintenance intensive too. And that's something we've really gotta be careful with because a singular mapping table is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're, again, on the HRS example, if you have, um, say, 90 fields that you want to bring in from ADP, um, uh, from their workers' records into your Dell Tech employee records, um, and if half of those require a data map, that's a very intensive maintenance process for folks later on. And not to mention, just as you add new divisions or change things, it's one more place you have to manage and maintain. So common data alignment between these two systems is crucial. And again, mm -hmm. not so much in the charity keyboard interface because you can say, oh, I know that Apple's a grape over here, right? But that's really, you know, you that kind of documentation or even better when you're doing a new implementation of a secondary system, like a new HRIS system, pay very close attention when you're, do, in t attention when you're doing the data loading there that you're going to eventually want this to come back, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to want this to feed back over. And that means that we've got to be very articulate with how the data is structured and how the individual columns and the values in those columns relate to each other. Yeah. So not only the values of those fields, but uh, if one thing is a numeric field and the other one's a character field, sometimes even that can can cause issues um, at times. Definitely. I mean, and look, that's that's common no matter what uh, piece of middleware you use or even if you build your own web services. Eventually, if uh, ADP treats something as a uh, binary, right, zero is negative and one is positive, mm -hmm. but then Dell Tech treats that as a uh, Boolean, a Y or an N, at that point, we're, there's a, granted, it's only one character, it's one little little byte, but you have to have a translation in there. Right. Yeah. And a lot of that can be done. Some of the middleware platforms will cater for that better than others. But def certainly if you're building your own web services, you've got to be cognizant of those kind of things. All right. Well, let's jump into lack of standardization. Yep. That is um, that, that's another big one. Right. Um, and that's typically when we're talking about that, um, the the unique identifiers mm -hmm. between two systems. Right. So um Going to keep on HRIS because it's a simple example. Um, but uh, uh, employee numbers, right? Um, in uh, UKG, you have a UKG employee number. It's completely separate from the Dell Tech ID, and it's actually a sequential number that you don't have any control over. Um, in ADP, it's kind of an internally generated, uh, generated unique identifier number, where your employee numbers are likely somewhat strategized, or maybe they're sequential. But in any case, maybe they don't align. So you've got to pay very close attention to the standardization between those two values. And it kind of plays back into the data mapping errors. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the lack of standardization can actually play directly into that, where um, you want to make sure that you always, one thing we always do, and I'd recommend this really almost for any of uh, the scenarios and the methodologies we talk about integrating earlier, even shared a keyboard interface to a degree, um, is make sure that you're storing so if, for example, in UKG or ADP, make sure you have the Dell Tech Vision employee number in there somewhere, just mm -hmm. as a reference point, right? Um, when you're building the integration, you know, again, find a way that makes sense to flow that back in or um, populate that in, um, you know, take that into account. But cross-population, cross <laughs> cross-population, I had to pause on that one for a moment. Um, it, of of the key values to the different systems is crucial for the, with this, with core records especially and unique identifiers. All right, what about the pitfall of data validation? So that's always a fun one. Um, 
<laughs> so um, one of the, if very often with these items, um, you want to have a, I don't want to say an extended user acceptance testing, but you want to have a thorough user acceptance testing process. Um, these, any of these solutions, once we get into ETL and above, and even file transfer, uh, you know, file loads to a degree, um, can have the potential to create absolute chaos if they're just turned on and nobody is watching it as it goes and looking to make sure that things are going properly. <laughs> what could um, go wrong, Pete? Come on. Right. It's, it's kind of the equivalent to turning on a fire hose in a sink, you know, um, with that is, is the result that you can typically obtain with that. So um, when you're building something, obviously working in test systems is very important. Um, it's very important to have uh, some of the stakeholders that you involve. And that's that's the key people that are kind of dealing with the that are the charity keyboard interfaces in some in some cases, mm -hmm. making sure that the data is consistent and accurate and complete. Great. All right. What about security concerns? This is a big one, and uh, I guess we picked the right example, you know, with uh, but we, we get it too with invoices and with uh, expense reports and things like that from some of the external spend management systems that we've we've helped clients with or that we've worked with, with our, ourselves in building. Um, certain information is is very you, you don't you want to have it in as little places as possible. You don't want it to be everywhere, right? Um, a single point of storage is just that many less places that you can have any kind of um, data breach occur mm -hmm. or um, concern over dissemination of information that you don't necessarily want out there. Um, a lot of the platforms, uh, most of the HRIS platforms out there, ADP, um, UKG, um, Paylocity, by default, um, when you query an employee record, they will completely obfuscate the social security number. Mm -hmm. It just shows up as a bunch of axes across the board. You have to actually fill out a form and request them to expose even four digits of that. And that's just because very validly they are they they are concerned about liability with that, as, as we all should be. You know, privacy and security in this day and age is a, is a big concern. So aside from even the systems you're using and making sure that you've that the <clears throat> provider or that your uh, technology team is doing all the crossing all the T's and dotting the I's uh, from the uh, security standpoint, from the infrastructure, you also should approach this from a data standpoint of just how can we most mitigate our risk with sensitive data, right? Um, if you don't need, uh, you know, if you start cutting paychecks out of a, a payroll provider and you don't necessarily need that banking information in Deltec, don't keep it there, right? Keep the obfuscated numbers so you know you have it and you can put a, put a point of reference. And even, you know, if you have self-service in Deltec for employees, they can reference it or other folks can look. but keep the sensitive stuff in one place. It's just that many less things you have to worry about. All right. I do have a couple questions coming in, but let's cover first the the next two. So network reliability and then maintenance and support. So network reliability is kind of like traffic jams, right? Sometimes you just don't have a lot of control over that. Um, uh, sunspots, uh, outages at your... Uh, third-party software provider, right? Um, maintenance windows do exist. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that a 99.9% mm -hmm. .9, uh, uptime still equates to about a week a year, right? It's not, you know, and, and that's not good, right? Um, but again, it does mean that you have, um, you, you will have occasionally um, outages, um, you know, for maintenance, uh, just for pure outages, um, network traffic, data providers, there's a myriad of things that can go wrong. So you, you want to make sure that the networks between your two systems are reliable and stable, especially if you're managing and maintaining those networks. In the cases of some uh, external systems, some uh, software as a service providers like a Salesforce, like a Concur, it's rare, but it does, it does happen. And there are outages. Um, some providers more than others, right? But um, <laughs> you want to make sure that what you're building has mechanisms. So when it inevitably does happen, because it, it will happen right? It's, it's the nature of the beast here. Um, but you want to make sure that you have recovery pathways, right? So you don't only want to be able to send over the invoice transaction you're shipping just once and then have it never be able to send again. You need a recovery path from that. And those kind of scenarios, especially when you're dealing with 
making it happen programmatically, automatically, those all have to be really drilled out and really, um, really fleshed out. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. And then, you know, where, where you have control over it, you know, and, and everyone already does, but, you know, make sure it's good and, and reliable and stable and secure um, and uh, have have backup plans, have recovery mechanisms, um, your retries that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we're a big fan of is after completing a web service call out somewhere, we like to come back to the originating system and write back, say, for example, an ADP, the Delta employee number. When that when that shows up but once the employee has been created we want that employee number to go to back to adp so that we've got it there it serves two purposes in the future we've got a point of reference for any other potential integrations we might may want to build um, or extend out but then we've also got just a confirmation that yeah this worked we got this um last updated a, a little date field is another great one to have in there just to just to give everybody a confidence check when they when they see it you know when you're updated on their chart chart yep and the last one? Oh, sorry, maintenance and support. Right. So, and this is a big one. Um, and, and this is kind of what we got into earlier with the code tables and the decisions you make up front when looking at something like this. A lot, a lot, a lot of us need to, you know, you need to go into these things recalling that we're a data migration. When you move to Dell Tech for the first time, any of you that did that, you know, or, or were present for that, it's a big project. There's a lot of data mapping. There's a lot of this conversation of like, we need something for this particular field here and it needs to be a why. So you need to tell us how to, we got to figure out together how to derive this. Um, integrations like this are almost like a continual data migration. So it never stops. And that means that um, this integration, however you do it, is going to have to be updated and maintained over time. If you acquire a new business, if you get acquired, um, and you want to keep using it. If you have other divisions come up, um, there, you know, the nature of your business um, is dynamic and changing. And the technology you build or that you work with, you want to make sure that it is able to evolve with you and that you're not just locked into it um, in terms of just it's rigid and this is it only does this and it only does it this way. Um, there are some things that just in the interest of making it quick to life um and reliable um you may need to do that in an occasion but just to have it well documented understand that this is something that may need to change those are considerations that you want to bring into play and the earlier you do it the better perfect uh we have a couple questions um so if the full sale partners black box is implemented does the that limit what dell tech updates we're getting or increase the amount of time effort to upgrade uh, to the next version. So with uh, with black box in particular, um, we uh, we stay ahead of Dell Tech updates, um, right? Our our bread and butter business has always been uh, Dell Tech consulting, um, Dell Tech customizations. As far as myself and my team are con are concerned, um, and so that means we've. We've uh, been been dealing with upgrades for a long, long time, right? Uh, every time they update a custom report namespace, we've got a lot of custom invoices. We've got to work with clients to help get up to the latest version or anytime there's there's changes. Most of the time, these changes are pretty consistent and pretty slight, right? Um, version to version, there's not much going on. Um, in fact, from vantage point four uh, through vantage point five, five, things were relatively consistent. But in around 5.5, they dropped a little uh, web service called Validate Login, right? Now, now that, that went away. It was actually supposed to go away a lot earlier, but it went away on that release. Um, we had been monitoring that. We saw it gone away, and we got ahead of it and basically before any of our clients had gotten out of uh, the early adopter phase and were able to address it. But with any integration, it's not, and again, I just want to highlight this. It's not just black box. We, and especially if you're in Dell Tech's cloud cycle, you always have a sandbox database. You'll always have a URL and an API key and the the, the mechanisms to be able to connect to it. Um, you'll want to you want to run some tests, right? Um, typically, what we do when someone uh, knows they're going to be moving from say Dell Tech Vision to Dell Tech Vantage Point, we like to get a bit, especially that one. That's a pretty big evolution, right? So when that mm -hmm. happens. We like to get in, make sure they have an instance of the connector connected up to their sandbox database. They can do things like poll expense reports from Concur or poll employees from ADP and just make sure that things are working as they expect. Um, from the back end technology standpoint of that, we cover all that. 
Um, if you're designing your own system, um, either working with a uh, middleware platform that is more like an SDK where you have to build and maintain your own, or if you're just building your own application, your own little web service that will facilitate these operations, that testing process is equally, if not doubly important. You'll be basically doing a lot of what we just handled for you with the black box side. Yeah. All right. I have another question that came in. In your experience, have your clients who have used Dell Tech Union Point had positive experiences and, or has it been troublesome due to pitfalls you, you have mentioned? Um, I have nope. to say that I don't yeah, have anybody cool. that's... Um, I think there's one client that I know of that is using Union Point. So right now I don't have a lot of experience so far, but I know you guys were a part of the the EA uh, for Union Point. Yeah, we were, we were part of the EA for Union Point, and we we got pretty in depth with it. We were obviously fascinated about it, and we we had prior to Union Point coming out, prior to us building Blackbox. I mean, we we looked into Snap Logic, MuleSoft, Zapier. I mean, there, there's a list of about fifty of them out there. They're all varying degrees of, uh, of functionality, everything like that. With Union Point in particular, I don't have any direct um, information on, on that. Like Sarah said, it's still relatively um, new. Um, I have not had the opportunity to work directly with a client on an implementation. Um, you know, it's, it's, so I, I, I don't have enough information to, to say, you know, success or failure. Um, I, I do know it, there's some pre-canned recipes um, from what I saw. There's some things that are going to be uh, expanded out on that. Um, you are going to want to have somebody of a uh, technically and data-minded nature, and it will really help that they have web services background with that. Um, uh, you know, and, and again, look, with, with any of that, somebody familiar with the structure, everything like that can be very, very helpful um in that kind of sense but yeah i unfortunately i i just don't have the direct um yeah jo jonathan I, I just don't have the direct uh, experience to be able to comment on that from an informed perspective all right perfect pete i'm gonna skip to our last question then come back to the um the previous one uh sure. that we were going to cover and so can you talk a little bit about best practices for a su successful integration? What people need to keep in mind as they're, as they're planning out their integration? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And really the, um, the and we kind of have it up, up at the top as, as far as uh, defining your project goals, right? Mm -hmm. But back to that um, uh, chair to keyboard interface, right? And, and the people doing the work and what they have to do what is done today and what do we want to improve what's the biggest problem dual entry of data is going to be the top of the list typically right but are there other efficiencies that we can identify by just having the opportunity to do these things uh, programmatically is there mm -hmm. something that those individuals or even subsequent individuals in the you know chain the life cycle of this uh, employee record or project record are there things that other people are having to go in and do that maybe we could help make easier? Maybe we could raise uh, raise a flag so that they could uh, manage these better. We could set it. We could, for example, if uh, HR is onboarding everyone in ADP again, let's use that. But then when it comes down into Dell Tech, accounting wants the opportunity to review the bill rates, review the job classification make sure that everything has come in, that the department's assigned correctly, the supervisor was set correctly, and then they check uh, check off ready for processing, right? Available for use in processing so that you can actually mm -hmm. enter transactions against that employee. Just little things like that can overall improve the lives of everybody involved uh, in, in the record management process. Perfect. Um, number two is really near and dear to my heart uh, as far as engaging stakeholders. Uh, I have to say I want to, as I have people that reach out to us on the sales side, one of the things I do find is that a lot of times it is the IT person. But as we start to ask questions, they then don't know because it's really the finance person or it's really the CRM type person. So can you talk a little bit about why it's important to engage the stakeholders? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and, and look, it's, it's a natural evolution when a, when questions like this come up as a, as a, as a former uh, te technology director for a civil engineering firm, 
anytime something like this came up, it came right to me, right to me and my team. Mm -hmm. um, and, and understandably so. Um, but we're only going to know so much, right? And, and that is, um, we could turn on a connector today for a client. And, and literally, it's a matter of running a script, making sure that, okay, we're setting up an account in Dell Tech, getting the credentials over in, you know, UKG. We could have data syncing today. We should. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the, again, from a technology standpoint, yeah, we could ship data back and forth all day. Can we make it work for your business processes? I, I always use this. I always say this on calls and I just adamantly believe in it. Technology is great and, and it's fantastic what we can do with these things. But if you're conforming your business to work within your technology, then that's the wrong way, right? The technology should work for your business. It should fall into line with how your processes need to be done. And the only way to really get that, and, and, and again, no matter how, how good your technology staff is going to be, ultimately, there's going to be a point where we're going to need some input from an accounting uh, person or from a, a HR person or someone that is in the uh, in the thick of it, dealing with this on a day to day basis that knows what they need. Um, and, and so it's again, it's very now what that means is that technology folks are going to know more about accounting and human resources terms than they ever wanted to. <laughs> and some of you, uh, some of you professionals in the other aspects of your business, you project managers, uh, you know, dealing with project creation as it comes in from Salesforce or what have you. You're going to know more about uh, terms like APIs and web services than you ever not wanted to. But um, you know, it, it's it's good to have that understanding to make sure that everybody realizes some value from the effort. Yeah. The third one I think is really important as well. I deal with this on the mapping side or understanding from HubSpot, for example, one of the things that we are continuing uh, to work with firms on. And one of the things that I really talk to them is that key to board process. Like we need to understand what the process is because most of the time they come to us saying, hey, we want an integration but yet we've never even used HubSpot or we've never even used marketing campaigns in Dell Tech Vantage Point. So can you talk a little bit more about why document requirements are such a mandatory thing that we really have to have those things? Well, and you, and you can see these are almost kind of like a, a Russian doll, right? Where you're like, you're <laughs> opening one and then there's another in there because they are all interdependent. Everything up to this point has built to this right here where a process requirement in terms of like, what do we need to have done? And then also so far as, because Sarah, you're right, a lot of times, and again, it's it's understandable. You're looking at this new cloud-based software as a service uh, platform. You use Dell Tech today. It's very exciting. You want to get in there and start working. Can you, all right, but before we go, can this integrate? Generally speaking, <laughs> the answer is yes. Right. right. But the, the it gets more complicated when you say, well, what though? Right. What do you what do we what are we looking to integrate? Right. And, and specifically, how does the direction directionality flow? What data points are coming in? What needs to happen there? It's really all everything we've talked about from the stakeholders and the goals that you have. Like we want to reduce duplication of entry. We want to keep the project managers informed of uh, new sales opportunities that have come to realization in the pipeline that we're managing out in this separate system, any number of things like that all build into step th this, this bullet point here, which is mm -hmm. defining your requirements. And it goes even beyond that in terms of um, like, okay, hey, a ADP, we want to be able to go in and update this particular value out there. And they say, well, sorry, we actually don't provide an endpoint to update that because that's an internal thing that we rely heavily on and we, we can't expose that to... Uh, to being manipulated from out, outside sources. We need to yeah. control that. Um, something as basic as that. I mean, sometimes the, the areas are just not available. A um, lot more commonplace in Dell Tech Vision back in the day, right? There are certain areas where you just could not get to through the API um, uh, without you know writing a stored procedure or some additional things. Vantage Point's a lot better with that, mm -hmm. infinitely better with that. Um, but but still, there are things that just you know can't be done easily through an API, or maybe there's just not an endpoint, and it depends on the vendor. But going in and mapping that out, doing that discovery based on the requirements you've gotten from your stakeholders, and that are based on your goals for it, are crucial. Yeah, and I I would have to say that as I've 
worked with different developers over the years. Bob Kottmeyer back in the day was one of the individuals that I think taught me the most. And I would say, but I, I wanted to do this. This is what we wanted to do. And he would say, okay, but what if they do this? And I was like, well, why would they do that? He's like, because people like doing things that you don't think about. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now we got to like backwards, you know, think about it. Well, what if someone does this, then how is this going, going to happen? And so like, as an example in HubSpot, you have an email. Well, we have a one-to-one -one relationship. Well, what happens if someone fills in, it's the same person, puts in an email address for their Hotmail or Gmail account. Now, what are we doing? Right. Now, how do we rectify? Are we overriding that information? And so, it, there's all those little scenarios that you have to think beyond just what you want it to do. You have to think be in what else people might do uh, that might muck up your system. <laughs> yes, right. And and you know, look, it's not like uh, you know users or any anyone is out there intentionally no. you know throwing things around. A lot of this is just folks trying to figure things out and get things in in the quickest way possible. Or they yep. may just, you know, like your scenario, like, hey, I've got a, I've got a bulk email address. You're not getting my real one, you know, that, right. that kind of thing. It, it will happen. But having those kind of things um, defined, really understood. And, and look, some of it, folks, no matter how much planning you get, you're going to be in user acceptance testing and say, you know what? Oops. That's not good. We got to <laughs> fix that. Let's yeah. get around that. Um, and that, again, underscores the importance of, you know, thorough user acceptance testing with any of yep. these things. And so you have develop a project plan as the next item. Yep. Yep. You want to have uh, an idea of the timelines, obviously, the commitments that you're making to your internal stakeholders, the folks who are looking to get this to make their, their functionality better. Your leadership group, you want to make sure that you're setting proper expectations. Um you know, a lot of the times, especially if you have somebody that's well versed in the technology or you're working with a technology partner that has um, a piece of middleware that's kind of uh, stood up and ready to go for this kind of thing. The technology piece can come can be pretty quick to life. Right. For the most part, um, oftentimes the biggest challenge is uh, a lot of what we talked about earlier. Right. That just these kind of manual processes of like, OK, what do we do today that we want to change? Right? Who are the people that will really understand this? Okay, what do we want it to do? What happens now? What do we want to have happen? Um, and how do we get in and plan for this? And then mapping of data and going back and correcting mistakes. You know, those kind of things can be some of the some of the bigger things uh, that can take up time. But um, that is again, you want to make sure that you're going in and that you have something to work with, and and you, that you understand too. You know, when you're dealing with data. And especially if some of the earlier pitfalls that we had uh, talked about start manifesting like uh, bad data entry or misaligned data values, things like that, that can um, elongate your time frame. So you, you, all, you almost want to build in some time for that and just even set expectations like, look, this is assuming these things line up as expected. Right. Um, and we, we may need to adjust, but mm -hmm. just can save you some some heartache in the long term if you're if you're clear with that and communicate up front as much as possible. Yeah. And on the next one, prioritizing features. I think this one's really important because sometimes you don't always need everything all at once. So maybe talk a little bit about prioritizing features. Yeah. You know, in in in, in my day of uh time of uh, writing software, we, we have a, a term called minimally viable product, right? Which is mm -hmm. base or MVP, right? And the idea is that when you're starting with something new and if you're writing it, if you're writing some code or e ETL, if you're doing web services, whatever it is, what is the very least amount that we need to do to make this provide value for the folks that need it done? Right, to make it where this is going to make life better, this is going to fix this problem, this is going to do, do so, what, what point do we need to get to to get there? Right now, it, when we're looking at, again, all of our requirements, everything that we want down the road, can we cherry pick from that and say, all right, and this kind of goes right in line with your project plan, right? What do we want to reach? What's the minimal point where we could say, yeah, you know what, this is good and we can actually use this to a degree. Let's go, let's go live and start realizing some of this value. Right. Let's let's roll this in once once mm -hmm. it's all done, completed, tested out. Um, it's very easy with this, especially when you're dealing with middleware platforms and things like that, or, or you know, a talented development team um, internally. 
to just say this is everything we want let's go for it let's let's say uh, you know and, and we want this to this to happen here and this to happen here this to happen here um those kind of projects in my in my experience tend to drag on much longer than projects that set foreseeable citable goals attainable mm -hmm. goals that are minimally viable and iterate those as you go you know segment those up group up your project plan group up your requirements into must haves for it to be viable right and nice to haves and then like you know and i, I never call anything pie in the sky because really you can do a lot with these things um mm -hmm. there's a lot of flexibility there but you don't you're you're not going to implement an end-to-end -end comprehensive system out of the box unless you're dealing with some kind of pre-built scenario and it just has everything that you want um but uh you know start start with what you need um and then work your way up and add those uh bigger feature enhancements and and bigger ass down the road as you go and as you get used to the system you may determine that you don't need it or it may change your understanding of what some of those more advanced functionalities actually need to be once you start using it um in the minimally viable uh capacity and i think that's true for any technology you have to crawl before you run you know there's multiple steps within there and i think that 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 should be kept in mind across the board. Yeah, Sarah, the folks on my team that uh, we, we do a lot of custom invoices for clients that need our custom reports. And one of the first things we do on a call to try and scope that is ask, have you tried to do this in Delta, right, natively? Mm -hmm. Not because we don't want to do the work, not because we're trying to push it off, but just because why pay for it if you can already do it with software right. you own, right? But but also, you know, just understanding what it is you're looking for and where where to find it. You know, it's, it's a good way to start. Yep. All right. Let's talk a little bit about testing and quality assurance. I would say that sometimes this is the area that people don't spend enough time on. Would, would you agree with that? It, yeah, it, the, the tendency is to do that. I know when, when we're working with folks, we tend to really focus on this and really, really, you know, require that it, it be focused on because, uh, at the end of the day, we have to support this thing when it goes live. Yeah. So we want, it needs to be it needs to be functional, and it definitely needs to be synchronizing the data and putting the things in the right place where it where it needs to go. Um, yeah, it it can draw out a little bit if you're not prepared for it, right? If any of the preceding steps have not been properly done or documented. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm I'm going to come back to uh, data mapping in particular. Right, um, you know, field to field relationship is one thing, but a field with 200 potential values that goes to another field with 200 potential values and none of a match, that's something else entirely. Not impossible, not insurmountable, but you want to be sure that those are being tested for. And again, if you can just if you get the data aligned up front, you don't need to test as deeply because you know it's like right. okay, as long as the values match up, we're good. We don't need to necessarily worry about maintaining this separate mapping area or the separate conditional expression that's built in. So, um, yeah, it, it is, you know, again, and I think, you know, it's, it's something that can, in the planning stage, it's not so much that when people get to it, everybody takes it very seriously, but in the mm -hmm. planning stage, sometimes it's not quite given enough weight and enough time allocation. Right. And especially because the folks in your organization, even if you're working with an outside party, you folks know your data better than anyone. You're going to know if it's messed up. Um, again, from a software standpoint, data moving is pretty good, right? Again, we we go deeper. We're Delta consultants over here as well, so we know it's got to line up and things have to be right for that. But um, that is to the, the data component is easy. It's the mapping component, the quality of your data map and the quality of your data relationships plays into how long this testing and QA process will take. Yeah. And you mentioned this last one, uh, ongoing, you know, you talked about maintenance and support in the previous one on things that could go wrong. Um, but I do think that this is probably one of the, the biggest areas that when people are looking to do things on their own, that a lot of times they don't really plan for this aspect to make sure that it's successful. They're focused on all the things that you talked up above, I understand I need to have documentation and I need to connect it and I need to have a clear goals and we need to test it. But a lot of times when people do it on their own, they're really not thinking about just like when you build a road, you, you built the road, now you got to maintain the road. Otherwise, those things continue to 
will start to cause issues. And so can you talk a little bit about why why this is so important? Ab- absolutely. Yeah. And and that is um, this this is definitely, definitely a big one. Um, and it actually speaks directly to Michael's question earlier, mm-hmm. um, which which is um, and I, I can actually relate it, relate it best in this way. The, the whole reason that um, we determined that we needed to do a centralized middleware platform like Blackbox is we were we were doing some web service solutions for a, a lot of our clients and we were doing it in the traditional way which meant we would develop a solution in visual studio we'd ask them what they wanted it in visual basic or c sharp we'd put it on their web server we'd deliver it out it would work perfectly well and then vision 6.0 would come out from after vision 5.1 right or 6.2 would come out or 7.0 would come out and all of a sudden we have all this code dis- distributed amongst all these clients and even in in an organization internal got all this code that now needs to be gone back through and touched to be able to ensure that it's it's testing properly and in the case of the Dell Tech Vision to Vantage Point migration it would need to be rewritten entirely mm-hmm. right in that case um and so those some of those things need to really be the, the planning for the the inevitable evolution of these software products, which will always happen. And we, and we want it to happen. Right. I don't think anybody would be satisfied if Vantage Point stopped where it was right now. Right. Or even if uh, ADP or uh, Salesforce or any of them just said, OK, yeah, you know what? We're good. You guys can just use this in perpetuity. Um, we want the feature improvements. But what that does mean is that there will eventually be changes that come down the pipeline. And managing those on a case by case basis, even a solution by solution basis, internal to your organization, again, it's not that it can't be done, but it is another layer of complexity, and it's something that is going to take additional time, resources, and effort. Um, it is one of the good things of working, and that, that's one area that we really use to set ourselves apart with the black box mm-hmm. connector platform. Our background is all Dell Tech. All right. Um, we also have a team of folks that eat, breathe, drink web services and uh, interconnectivity like this. So, you know, we are aware of the upgrades, uh, the, the changes to the programming interface, the APIs on the Dell Tech end of things. Um, with the other endpoints, we also keep abreast of those, keep, uh, you know, where we can uh, form alliances and partnerships. We do that. But the idea is that you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's more like a power bill that stays on. You just need to make sure other middleware platforms they'll have new potentially api you know authentication uh, methods the here here's the new adp authentication method you can use for the next gen adp product right or yeah. here's uh here's a new uh endpoint where you can now get your uh, uh direct deposit information in and out of uh the 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 area um or hey you know what we decided the last one wasn't quite good so we decommissioned that and here's a completely different one that you got to work with and they're trying to be helpful, but from a developer standpoint, and certainly from a business standpoint and a stakeholder standpoint, you just want your things to work. Right. Um, so it is absolutely something that, especially if you're building your own, if you're working with something that's more along the SDK line of things, where you're taking ownership of the middleware piece and kind of uh, facilitating the build in that sense, you do need to be aware of that. Um, the, again, a lot of these things, uh, these middleware pieces will have prepackaged stuff done for you. And it's just that you got to look close at those and see, all right, well, now what layer are, of this are we responsible for versus you being responsible for? Yeah. Um, and again, that's kind of where we 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 just got tired of it with having to go out and say, hey, we need to send you new code again. Uh, just, uh, you know, go through the testing cycle and all that. And we centralized everything. Yeah. Um, so then now we're just we just sit in the cloud and folks call it out. And, you know, when you move to Vantage Point, we just set you up a Vantage Point connector. If you're on Vantage Point 6. We just uh, make sure you, you have anything you need for Vantage Point 6, which which, again, after 4.0, Vantage Point's been a lot more consistent. So uh, the publishers, too, one thing. To, sorry, Sarah, one more thing. Publishers do tr- do their best to make those disruptions minimal. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's why a lot of the stored procs you have when you move to vantage point from vision will work just fine. Some of them need to be tweaked a little bit because mm-hmm. vendors aren't vendors, they're cleanders now. So we're first, right? right? Um yep. but yeah, just something to be aware of again. Perfect. Well, 
Pete, thank you so much. A lot of information today. And I also do want to remind everybody that we do have the blog coming out tomorrow where Pete will talk a little bit more about what APIs are, a little bit more about the methods and the endpoints. Uh, and I would like to encourage you to share this video with your tech individuals, uh, other people that are thinking within your firm about integrating with a, a system just so they can understand a little bit more on what it actually takes uh, to integrate. And so Pete, thank you so much. I don't see any other questions, uh, but I wanna thank everybody that joined us and I wanna thank you for taking the time to help educate us on this system integration process. Sarah, it was great talking to you today and I hope everybody uh, got some value out of it. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.